Welcome to Diverse and Inclusive Leaders. This is the show where I speak with the most inspirational and thought-provoking leaders of today and unearth their unique stories of diversity and inclusion to help inspire, educate and motivate others to make the world a better place. Today, I am really looking forward to speaking to the wonderful Midge McCall. Now, Midge is the group head of engagement and communications at Odeon Cinemas Group, a brand that the majority of us absolutely love and will know very, very well, I'm sure, from our childhood days and even through to our adult years. Now, Ms. joined Odeon Group back in 2015, and she's really spent a lot of time creating an internal comms framework from the ground up. She's developed and led a range of colleague communications, external communications, and 15 country integration program as well as the launch of the diversity and inclusion strategy. She's passionate when it comes to values-based culture and making a difference to the wider business world and society. Welcome to the show, Midge. Thank you very much, Leila. I'm exhausted just listening to the bio. I, <laughs> and I cut that down as well, Midge. No, I, I, I'm already, I am the one who is nervous myself already on this podcast thinking, wow, you know, we've got a real great communications expert here who's probably thinking, wow, you know, should we tweak that? Should we edit that? You know, how can we bring out the best here? And I kept it brief deliberately, Mitch, because I think what would be fantastic just to kickstart the show is to learn a little bit more about you personally. Because I know we've had the chance to chat about your background and you coming over to the UK and all the cultural experiences you've had, uh, both personally and professionally. And I think it'd just be wonderful to start from the ground up to, to tell our listeners a little bit about how you came to be where you are today. Well, first of all, there is absolutely no plan. I decided very early on in uh, my, my life to follow my heart, not my head. And, and that's probably not a great thing in some, in some places, but um, I'm Australian if you can't tell yet from my accent. And uh, I grew up on the northern beaches of Sydney. Very, very wonderful parents who, who were very much open to all sorts of diversity. And, and um, my mum worked with people with disabilities. So, so from a very young age, we were quite used to difference despite living in a very white um, Anglo surfing world. I moved to Japan and taught English there for a while, which put me on the other side of, of being in, in the minority. So it's all relative. And that's something it's, I love about language. You know, people in, in the UK say I'm Antipodean, but actually I'm just on the other side of the world. So I moved from English teaching into the arts because I was following my heart into training and, and eventually landed in comms and reinvented myself again and moved to the UK and just have loved every minute of, of the jobs that I've worked on here, finding internal comms as something quite new and novel. Um, it's kind of a, a newish genre of discipline. Uh, so yeah, for me, it's all about culture. It's about language and comms and how those things can bring diversity, inclusion, corporate responsibility, you know, all the good bits of um, work culture and life together with the hard stuff, trading and commercials. I love the way that you use the word reinventing and reinventing yourself. Um, and I'm really excited to come back to that actually in just a moment. But I must ask first of all, um, and obviously um, in Australia, I'm sure many of our listeners have been there. I love, love Australia. Um, and part of me was thinking, the little voice in my head was thinking, why would you come from such a beautiful place with amazing uh, climate through to uh, through to England? And of course, you've, you know, throughout your career, Mitch, you've worked in lots and lots of different sectors. You know, you mentioned that very modestly there wasn't a plan um, but you're in teaching and, and worked across in Japan and then came to the UK you know talk to me a little bit about kind of the decision making throughout that journey because I'm sure you know many who, who are tuning in and certainly myself I find the world of comms and PR absolutely fascinating and I've had the opportunity to learn a lot more about it over the recent uh, recent past 
how did you come to be in, you know, obviously a, a group PR role, um, you know, being the mouthpiece externally and internally for this organization along that journey? Was it serendipitous? Was it something that then became more planned? How did that happen? Uh, so a little bit of both. Uh, I am a lover of stories. You know, I'm a reader. I majored in English. Um, so words have always been my my thing. I love the magic of comms. To me, it's it's a it's a bit like magic. You don't know how it works, but you can see the effects. So I guess all my jobs have had comms at the core or words or the arts. So we worked at the Sydney Opera House and and I still volunteer now at Shakespeare's Globe, which I love. Um, but there was something about probably the discipline of the English teacher training that I did that pulled me towards the comm side of, of businesses. And, and in some of those places, I was doing things that I do now without knowing necessarily that that was the discipline and that was that was a role you know in some of my early jobs in Australia I was doing external PR for a charity but at the same time making sure that everybody inside the charity knew what was going on and and it wasn't a specific role back then but it was something that I was always doing and always drawn to I think you know in the, in the recent months, I've probably written a novel's worth of comms for Odeon Cinemas Group. And nine and a half thousand people have read that novel. And, and maybe one day there is a real a novel inside me, but um, there's just something about words and stringing them together that I adore. I love that. I love how you describe that. And, you know, you're absolutely right. It is about storytelling and also bringing the best, you know, I guess, out of not only the individuals and bringing out and harnessing the potential of their real authentic selves and how they would sound, how they would speak, but also doing that and emulating that from a brand perspective, um, you know, with some of the great work you've obviously been uh, been doing at Odeon. And I wonder whether, um, you know, before we move into talking about the role of, of comms in the storytelling piece, which I think is such an interesting subject in particular when it comes to diversity and inclusion whether you could talk to us a little bit about some of the great stuff that um that Odin are doing and that, that you are doing because I know um you know from uh, many others within Odin that you're doing a fantastic job and and writing this novel as you explain it to be um you know would be fantastic to to hear more about well I guess our our most recent DNI journey and the one that I've been on with Odin began back in around 2017 and we really reinvigorated our DNI policy. And we decided to start with women because that was where we could make the biggest impact. So we did a lot of work around empowering women, focus groups, talking to people, and, and just making sure that, um, for me, it was making sure that the comms was as inclusive as it could possibly be. So I couldn't choose who the people were um, in the roles, but I could make sure that if we were doing a booklet that we had a, a range of ages and faces and ethnic backgrounds represented and disabilities and, and out and out gays and whatever it is that people are proud of uh, being, that we could really showcase that. And that's one of the great things about Com. So um, we did a toolkit to make sure that people could talk about people with disability in the right way that you put the people first and and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, we moved on to LGBT uh, the following year. And then uh, last year we started a little bit about ethnicity, didn't quite get it off the ground. And then of course, Black Lives Matter happened this year. And I think that just started the conversation and, and really comms is about starting conversations. You know, for us, it's it's about, you know, we're, we're the storytellers and we will help bring a story to life, but we're not the story, you know, we, we're the channel to bring that story in. And, you know, I've used the diversity calendar that a lot of various groups have put out to make sure that, you know, each, each week on the huddle, we will mention Diwali or we will mention, you know, it's not just Christmas, it's Hanukkah and what else is happening. So there's that sort of thing. Plus, people are probably sick of me who know me probably sick of me talking about menopause but um you know 
we got to start the conversation. We've got to use the M word. Absolutely. And, you know, it's it's that authentic storytelling comes from people who've been through something and and you know I could talk about the menopause till the cows come home but that's a different story but it but it is about if you are experiencing something you want the opportunity to talk and that's what comms does and that's what we're doing in Odeon we have Odeon chats where we talk to people about you know perhaps someone struggling with their mental health and they want to tell their mental health story and that will inspire others inspire others transgender people like all sorts of opportunities to surface the stories to help people give their message that's that's what I love and that's what we're doing at Odeon we're, we're not perfect and we're not there yet but we are we're turning up the dial I'm relishing the fact that you've used the M word menopause and are talking about in the context of this rich smorgasbord of diversity, um, because that is what it's about. There are so many different facets and different elements to individuals, not just that you are very passionate, say, about gender diversity and um, in a furthering, say, female empowerment, but there is also all of those other underlying facets that make you up as a human being, whether it be menopause, whether it be mental health, um, and everything else that sits below that surface level. What I'd really like to kind of talk about is, is you know, to a degree why, um, and maybe this is my, my naivety, is why there isn't, and I remember saying this to you on our first conversation, in fact, why the role of PR and comms is not talked about more in relation to diversity, inclusion, belonging, inequality. Because frankly, you guys and girls are... And again, I'm just, you know, always myself here, probably not the right word, but you guys and girls are the puppet masters that sit behind and move the strings and make sure that everything is positioned and you bring out this rich, authentic story from the right individuals, right brands, and, and share that with the wider world. I know as a role, sometimes it's one that sits behind the scenes, but I did my, I did even more research before we, we, we came onto the podcast today, and there just isn't loads and loads of rich information about people working inside comms and PR that are out there as the front faces when it comes to DNI. Like, why? Why is that? Well, well, so we, I think we have to separate PR and internal comms because they are, you know, totally interrelated, but they are quite different disciplines in a way. And one is out there and external and often is the spokesperson or the official talking head. And then the internal comms, I, I, I'm visible in Odeon. People know me and they get to know me very quickly, but I'm usually, as you say, the, the orchestrator, I'm the gardener and I'm the one who's digging the weeds and, and pruning the flowers and the garden's on show, you know, the orchestra's on show. We're not the ones who, who are necessarily front facing. Yeah, it's not about us, mm -hmm. it's about the message. Mm -hmm. And I think, that's a really important thing when you are a comms person is that you are not the message. You may be the spokesperson, you may be the channel, but, but actually people need to hear that authentic story from the person whose story that is. I can help them craft the story or I can help project them onto the stage, but it's not my story. And, and I think, you know, yes, I think, this COVID has brought comms professionals to the fore and we should be on the boardroom uh, table, well, not on the table, but at the boardroom table. <laughs> um, that's a different kind of party, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would argue very much that, that comms people should be directors on boards and leading companies, but, you know, we'll get there. Let's start a movement, Midge. Let's start yeah. a movement for... Well, <laughs> the CIPR and, and a number of other fabulous comms bodies doing all that work. So, yeah. Well, this will make you laugh. And I, I did have, uh, you know, fantastic individual, Ruan Kodakar, actually, who came on the show and was talking about comms and PR and DNI, because he, like yourself, is very passionate about this. Um, but I, I recently was speaking to someone from PRs, but very senior PR individual who, who I've worked with on sharing stories of other leaders. And I said to him, hey, you should come on the show. You'd be fantastic. And no word of a lie, 
he said, honestly, I know this sounds ridiculous, but I need to get PR approval for it. Because they like <laughs> to keep me. And I know, I knew you'd laugh at that. Um, he said, because, you know, they, they like me to be behind the scenes. Now, I know every organization is different. And what I love is that, um, you know, you're, you're, you're here and you're talking about the importance of this role. So I think, you know, in many facets of the C-suite, you know, it's an area that people don't actually know all that much about. But, uh, but it was just interesting that there are um, certain organizations where, where PR individuals are kind of tucked away. <laughs> and I think, well, yeah, I, you know, you can be a great mouthpiece for other people and you can curate and, and kind of tell this, you know, tell the story, the real story behind individuals. But, you know, definitely should be also speaking out as well, you know, as an asset to the business. You know, PR and comms sure. is so powerful. I, I do actually advocate that everybody speak to their PR person before they go and do anything. Um, but, uh, <laughs> and the Not internal biased. comms person. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think, I think, you know, often, well, you should always be in the heart of the business. You know, comms are the connectors and we're the ones who hear a lot of stuff. And if I don't hear it directly, I hear it from someone else. And I put two and two together and I make seven I don't know how that works I'm not a mathematician but <laughs> you know we we actually are the centerpiece of the organization and we know a lot of stuff and we help people connect and and so you know this message here and this message here actually go together and and I'm that's what I think we can do um, and if it's an opportunity to stand up and we have to be the the mouth's the speaker or the, the mouthpiece that's fine I don't have a problem with that but I'm I am just as comfortable just handing over and letting other people you know sing mm -hmm. I'm going to play devil's advocate if you don't mind me here asking a, a question that I've been been burning to kind of know the answer for um, and don't feel free, feel that you have to have to answer it um, but have you ever had like an absolute kind of PR comms nightmare um, because I know you pretty well and when it comes to knowing your personal um, you know your personal ethics your personal drive is very much about you know telling that real authentic story but also doing the best for the brand at the same time you know there would be individuals out there saying oh you know that's their, just their PR team that have told them to say that or CEOs maybe you know not talking about the Odin here please don't tell me off everyone um, but I've heard people saying in particular when we talk about kind of the Black Lives Matter movement and, and, and you know the, the tragedy of the killing of George Floyd and such that CEOs came out and, and and showed their support now I thought this was fantastic so I think you know the more people can say regardless you know of, of where it necessarily comes from the more the narrative will change the more the dial will move naturally but those that would be you know potentially quite critical would say well it's the PR teams and the comms teams that forced them to say that so where is kind of that line it's it's like an interesting kind of you know continuum almost or a balancing act between you know getting what's right and what is ethical and telling that real authentic story whilst also doing for the best for the brand which I know you do but you know has there ever been like situations where, where does that sit in terms of those ethics and and, and kind of you know the, the the watch outs for really good PR professionals to to do the right thing well, I mean, you're right. Our job is to make sure that what is being said is the truth and is good for the brand. But ultimately, you need a leader who believes that too. And re really, really lucky working with Mark Way and Paul Donovan before him at Odeon and Carol Welch and, and all our other leaders are genuinely people, people. So, I, I advise around the edges, but I've, I've actually, honest, hand on heart, never had an issue that I've, they've gone to say something and I've disagreed. That has happened in a previous role uh, when I was asked to write something or put out something and uh, I actually totally disagreed with it and I... I, it's really hard to say what it is without giving away where I worked because I don't want to. I don't want to say which one it was, but I did just say no to the the CEO and said I'm not doing that. I think you know if you want that to happen, this person can do that, and if they don't have a problem, then you put that out. But but I can't 
do that. And actually he respected me for that and agreed in the end and we pushed it away elsewhere. But, but I, I had to summon up the courage. I had a very good relationship with that CEO, a really excellent, excellent place to work. And it was just one of those little decisions and you just thought, no, 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 I can't. So, you know, as I say, I follow my heart and I could have got fired potentially. I didn't. And we all live to tell the tale, half the tale. Well, that, I mean, I have to say, superb answer, superb answer, Midge. And, you know, it's so... It's so gratifying to hear, and you know, obviously, I know some of the leaders at Odin. I know yourself, and you know, think very, very highly of you all, indeed. Um, but it's so just reassuring, gratifying to hear, um, you know, that the really super strong HR execs out there are willing to challenge and push back. And I guess you know that's probably a real key skill that is is a prerequisite to the role is, is being able to uh, yeah. deal with lots of different types of personalities, really bring them out of them, you know, them being their best selves, whilst also um, challenging and telling the real, true, authentic story as is. Absolutely. And, it, and it's really about negotiation, influence. And, and, and those are two things that I've spent quite a bit of time on my own self-development. You know, when I, when I first started teaching, I have a very high speaking voice. And when I first started teaching, I did my first prac at a boys' school. I was, what was I, 19, 20 years old. And I went into this school and I had these kids just leaping everywhere, just being appalling. And, I, and I'd be saying, sit down, sit down. And they would laugh at my voice because that's what boys do. And I had to actively lower my voice and train myself not to laugh when they did something that was actually quite funny or turn to the board. Um, but, but that's the same, that was the start of me thinking, how do I negotiate with these young people? I have to change what I can change. I can't change them, but I can change the way I influence them or the way I talk to them. And it is about rationalizing what you're doing, what they need to do, uh, rationing, uh, rationing, uh, getting all, marshalling all your um, arguments together. And sometimes it's soft influencing and sometimes it's hardball. Just, I'm sorry, you just can't do that. That's not right. Um, and I guess yeah. that use of inclusive language is incredibly key. And, and I'm, you know, probably taken a lot of those early uh, learning lessons through to, to where you are right now, because, you know, we've talked a lot about the differences, you know, the visible and the invisible differences with individuals and, you know, how you, you know, I guess how you, pull out those those kind of real inner strengths to to then tell that story um you know externally but uh, you know talk to me a little bit about you know kind of the the i suppose some hints and tips you know or 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 you know ways that that we can learn about the importance of inclusive language because whilst that is obviously something which is key to pr i think it's something that is quite valuable to other walks of of business as well Absolutely. And language is so powerful. You know, it can totally build inclusion or it can totally exclude people. And that starts in the playground, you know, kids shouting names at each other. And it comes to work in really, really often gentle things that are, you know, that everyday racism that pervades under everything. So for me, you can make people feel valued and respected by using inclusive language. Um, at Odium, we always use us and we and our, and we talk about our people or our teams or our colleagues. We don't use the word staff. Um, I think when you're talking about people who have a disability, it's always the person first. And it's, you know, people who use a wheelchair rather than a wheelchair bound person. I worked uh, in a blindness charity in Australia and uh, just learned so much about inclusive language there and how to, you know, introduce yourself into a conversation when you're talking to people who are blind uh, or with low vision. Things like gender neutral terms, people say, oh, it's politically correct, but but it's not at all. It's actually about being accurate and relevant 
and respectful. And for me, you know, if you come from a place of respect, if you come with an open mind, even if you get it wrong, apologize or ask. And, and I always think ask with humility and respect. So, you know, the Black Lives Matter, I didn't know necessarily all the things that were happening. Um, people just, you know, of color, just leaving their houses were in danger of being shot. And then I spent quite a bit of time looking at Australian Aborigines and what was happening there. And, and it was just an absolute opportunity to learn so much about other people. So for me, you know, words, words are power. And we should use them for good, not evil. You're a definite glass half full girl. I love that. I <laughs> Definitely. And it, 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 it's, you know, I don't want to say spinning, but it, it you know, it is turning every opportunity, um, you know, especially when they be difficult ones, i.e., you know, everything with, with, with the Black Lives Matter um, movement into a positive learning opportunity. Um, because ultimately, we as human beings, uh, you know, we can't expect it to be perfect uh, all the time. Um, you know, doing our best is, you know, of course, absolutely critical but I think there is sometimes this almost this fear and this concern with some that they worry so much about saying the wrong thing or doing the right thing that they think they'll be vilified for for saying um, something which may not be PC when actually as you say when it comes from a good place, whether that's even a naive place to to a certain extent, God knows, you know, I've said, um, you know, I'm sure a, a number of things now, you know, proud to be a diverse and inclusion practitioner and someone who lives, breathes and sleeps the subject, but this is an ever evolving evolution um, and a journey that we go on, you know, back in the day, you know, it was LGBTQ plus, uh, sorry, LGBT, um, you know, now LGBTQ plus, um, you know, this is a, a constantly evolving evolving world and um you know how passionate you are about intersectionality um you know into that mix you know there's always always going to be new pieces that come into that story and I'm, I'm quite sure the future of diversity and inclusion and belonging will not just be um you know the number of facets that we speak about openly but there will be diversities within the diversities within the diversities and so on absolutely do you know it's funny so when I was working in uh, a previous role I was I was writing a story about, uh, I think it was one of the Stonewall or LGBT had put out a list of leaders. And um, I had written a gay woman instead of lesbian um, to describe this person in our business. And uh, she contacted me to say, was I deliberately avoiding the L word? And I was thinking, oh, I think gay woman is a bit more uh, modern perhaps I'll just use gay woman because, and I made the assumption that, you know, that's what she wanted to be called. She's like, no, I'm a lesbian. I want you to call me a lesbian. So I, I tried not to write senior lesbian, uh, even though she was a very senior person, um, but I did manage to change my story so that uh, we got lesbian in the story and, and, you know, things like that. I made a mistake. Uh, she the called me out on it, but yeah. I explained to her what my reasoning was. She's like, no, just go for it. So, yeah, we, we all make mistakes. Um, but it's great to have that conversation, though, hey, isn't it? And, um, you know, clearly she she absolutely was was fine about it. You had the discussion and and moved on in the way in which she wanted to be uh, to be talked about. And, and that's the important thing. You know, as I say, it's not my writing it's her so yeah the whole intersectionality thing I, I know literally the the meaning of intersectionality and and the um the sometimes lethal combination of of the hand that you're dealt or the experience you've had and and that can cause mega privileges for people it can cause mega discrimination you know if you are a woman who is black with a disability how many more challenges are you facing to, you know, a middle-aged white woman who was brought up on the beach? You know, it's, it's, um, I think we need to think about, I think we need to think about difference, but we need to remember the inclusion and the belonging side that we need difference, 
but we are fundamentally all the same. And that comes back to the humility and the openness that is really important to me. And I've got to touch on the M word. I hope you don't mind because I know you said previously uh, that you could talk about the menopause until the cows come home. And I likewise could talk to you until the cows come home about lots of different subjects. Um, but I wanted to bring it up in particular because this is a subject that is not talked about anywhere near the amount that it should do and you know again I concur on the intersectionality pieces but then again this is another part you know as you as a female um you know you um you know going through menopause and you know other pieces of which you know I may not even know about um but talk to me briefly before we kind of go into our into our lightning round um <laughs> a little bit about you know why it's so important to talk out about the m word or or menopause because I think it's something that in particular leaders I have spoken to really kind of I can see them visibly squirming in their seats when the subject comes up it is a taboo subject uh, and it's partly to do with this is the age that women become invisible, isn't it? You know, traditionally, you know, there's not many Shakespearean roles, for example. There's a few more movie roles these days. Women are just kind of disappearing around this age in life. Um, marriages break up, sometimes for the good, sometimes not so for the, for the wife. I think the thing about menopause is, it is embarrassing. There are so many, you know, there's something like 35 symptoms. Can you imagine 35 different symptoms? And I swear I've got 33 of them. But um, either, either you're going to go through it, if you're lucky to live that long, you're going to go through it, or someone you know is. So if you're a man, you may have a mother or a sister or a partner, or, you know, a child. So it's not just women. And if you are a woman, you also have mothers and sisters and, and children and goddaughters and, and children who are part of your extended family. Um, so there's no getting away from it. We really need to help people out, you know. We need air conditioning and we need I, I tell you on the train I used to honestly I could pick the menopausal women on the train because we would all be eyeing off the seats we'd be opening the windows we'd be loosening our coats you know we'd be the ones sitting there having the hot blush so so I think a trains should have seats for menopausal women as well as um, pregnant people and people with a disability but I think if you talk about it, you take out all the air and it becomes much easier for everybody to live with. You know, when when that woman's on a on a bit of a rant, you know, it's OK. I think it's a very good point. And whilst I've not been through menopause yet, um, it's well, it's basically 50 percent ish or thereabouts of the population so why on earth would we not talk about it um you know i've empathized a, a lot with my my, my mum uh, bless her and other friends um, of mine with the fan out um specifically getting absolutely boiling but it's a lack of concentration as well or is that is what i hear i mean i'd love to learn more about it but you know that lack of concentration and it's already you know bad enough sometimes that you know they say 30 percent worth of those in a, in a minority are, are spending that amount of time worrying about how um you know how they fit in but you layer upon that um you know something which has got such overt sometimes physical symptoms such Absolutely. as the hot flush you know how and on earth do you concentrate in a board meeting but also the, you lose confidence. So, so one of the symptoms is suddenly for no reason, you think you're not good enough. You know, you start to doubt yourself. You get angry or you get weepy or, you know, you, your hormones are going crazy. And, and we forgive all that stuff in, in teenagers, but we forget, you know, this is happening to women. You know, one of my favorite sayings is I'm all out of estrogen and I've got a gun. Um, which is, uh, you know, basically look out, um, which is probably not 
very PC. That is but, a fantastic uh, expression, though. Well, it's not fantastic. That's probably the wrong choice of words here. I'm like now fluffing up my words knowing I'm speaking to a PR exec here. But it says what it is. And hey, sometimes if we can't say what it is with the emotion in which it is often come from, then what can we do? I can, I can quite imagine um, that it would be incredibly, incredibly difficult. But it's clearly not stopping you in any way, shape or form, Midge, because you're absolutely <laughs> a, <laughs> better than ever. Yeah. And <laughs> you know, I guess, well, I mean, does it help focus the mind as well sometimes? Because, you know, it's, you know, and, and, it, and it upsets me a lot when I hear that there's, you know, lack of confidence and, and kind of worry and concern and everything like that with people who are, like yourself, absolutely blooming fantastic and more than capable of doing what they do. But I hear from a lot of my friends who have been, had babies or, you know, say going through the menopause, it's almost made them more focused to prove that they absolutely are as good as they always have been. Not that they should have to prove it, but do, has, it, has it changed the mindset in any way? Absolutely. And I think there is something quite freeing in the menopause that, and you do, you are now a woman of a certain age who, do you know what? I don't care what anyone else thinks about me now. I've, I've lost all of that when I'm, when I'm not weeping in the corner because my, my hormones are going crazy. Um, but yeah, it, it is empowering in some ways as well. And to be able, just to be able to put a name to it, to actually find out that is a symptom and it's okay, that gets you through it, you know. If I'm not sleeping or I'm just, you know, thinking my mental health is not great, then I know what it is and that's half the paddle of, of dealing with things, isn't it, is putting a name to it and, and then doing something about it. But I'm lucky too in that I can talk about it at work People have responded, you know, really well. Um, there was a time, uh, like two years ago, when when my boss allowed me to come in half an hour, you know, half an hour work, late for work. Can you imagine that these days? Uh, because I just needed that extra sleep and couldn't get on a train crowded with people. You know, I needed to get on a slightly later train. That meant I wasn't the one knocking people out to open the windows and get a seat. Midge, this has been so incredibly enlightening and I, I, well, I, I was going to say I hope, but I actually know that this has helped many people out there who will be listening into all of this and, you know. I hope so, I hope so. Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm already thinking, hey, let's start the, um, you know, the menopausal PR club here. Um, well, financial, it's... financial Conduct Authority started an M club and really? uh, it was brilliant. It was open to men and women. It was very, very, very good. I don't know if it's still going, but uh, yeah, it was great. We should definitely check that out. And you know, before we wrap up today, I'd love to just ask a couple of lightning round questions. And I know sure. we, uh, we, we, we asked you about it in, in advance. So we'll go ahead and just ask a couple if that's okay. And, you know, the first, the most difficult one first, uh, probably. And that is, you know, what has been your secret to success? Uh, it's completely random. I think I think it's the fact that I've continually continually challenged myself. I've tried to be different. I love change, um, which is why I've changed jobs so often. I like to be as creative as I can and teach myself skills. I've taught myself video editing and how to design on on things like Canva. Um, you know, word clouds were a big thing. Um, I found those and and. In, introduce them to the council where I was working, um, online jigsaw puzzles, those sorts of things. I just try and, and take something in a slightly different direction. Love it. And how about any of your heroes or sheroes, whether they be personal, whether they even be someone who's, you know, adorned the screen of the Odeon? Well, uh, lots of those. Julia Gillard, uh, who is a former Australian Prime Minister, and she's now chair at uh, the Global Institute for Women's Leadership at King's College in London. She was an amazing PM. She faced incredible misogyny, incredible attacks in office on her and her partner. 
And she gave a magnificent speech in the house that I think will go down in history. Um, she's got a brilliant podcast series actually called The Podcast of One's Own, which I highly, highly recommend. And she talks to other inspiring, um, amazing, talented women. She, she would be my, my big shero. And finally, if you could go back in time and speak to... And not have menopause. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could ask that question as well. But if you could go back in time and give your, give your younger self some advice, say it's before you've left Australia or something like that, when you're setting out a foot of this mountain and this journey before you travel off the world to Tokyo and the UK, what advice would you give to your younger self and or indeed anyone who's in, in a similar circumstance who wants to explore the world of uh, PR, of comms, as you have done? Well, I would definitely say keep following your heart. It will all work out. Um, but, but I would also say, you know, don't be afraid to fail. Cut yourself a bit of slack because I was very hard on myself, not in a... Uh, ambitious driven way but in a wanting to do the very best and and near enough was never good enough and I think there are times and and this is part of being a 50 something year old woman god damn it near enough sometimes is good enough you know and and you just have to do it and be proud of it and move on what a fantastic answer. It's like literally the perfect way to, to end the show. And Midge, I personally have learned such a lot. It's been enlightening oh, um, for, for, for me. And, and I always give a summary at the end, and there's a lot of rich things to touch upon here. But I think, you know, first and foremost, the M word the menopause mm. let's talk out about it more frequently whoever is listening into this podcast whether you be a ceo whether you be an exec whether you be a young graduate embarking on your career give some consideration to this and also know some of the signs um you know know some of those signs and, and try yeah. and normalize the fact that we can talk about this because ultimately someone you know someone in your family um you know 50 of the population are absolutely going to be going through this and so um you know don't be alone and if you are suffering please 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 do reach out um in particular if being affected by anything uh, from this podcast but i also really loved from from our conversation as well is this rich conversation around PR and comms and language the beauty and the power that can sit in the language of how we describe and how we bring our authentic stories to the forefront as Midge has described and you know you heard it from a PR expert as well um your your, your yourselves who are, who are listening in is don't beat yourself up and don't worry too much about saying or doing the wrong thing because we're all human yes um you know finding that right language and that inclusive language is absolutely critical but ultimately Ultimately, it is not going to happen overnight. And so being forgiving and coming from a place of real heart and soul and caring is truly what matters the absolute most. So thank you very, very much, Midge, for joining us today. Thank you, Layla. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. You're so welcome. And if you missed anything from today's show, uh, don't worry at all. You can check it out on Apple, on Spotify, directly on our website. Um, we'll make sure we put all of the links, all of the key learning points uh, that Midge has mentioned, in particular the recommendations as well from podcasts and inspirational individuals she's mentioned and some of the topics we've discussed around importance of language and importance of comms. So if you missed anything, do not worry. Everything is available to catch up and demand. Make sure you visit us at www.dialglobal.org forward slash podcast. And we'll look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you so much for watching the Diverse and Inclusive Leaders podcast. Please do feel free to hit the like button below. Or if you'd like to receive future notifications, do ping the notification bell here at the side. If you're interested in the audio version only, you can find it on the following streaming platforms. Any extra info and descriptions will be in the links below. Look forward to seeing you soon.